Good morning. I'm glad you're here. I say that every week, don't I? Oh well. I guess it must be true. All right? Anyway, we're going to be talking today. We're going to finish up uh, this book of Colossians, and we're going to be talking about partnerships, uh, partners in ministry. Before we do, I kind of want to open it up a little bit and see uh, what you think the good of partnerships are. And what are some of the dangers of partnerships? And, you know, what kind of partnerships are you, uh, do you anticipate, do you work with? You know, for instance, you're, if you work uh, with a company, you're a partner with somebody there, unless you are work alone. But anyway, uh, what are some of the positive things about partnerships in our lives? Two heads are better than one. That's right, unless one of them isn't. <laughs> That's a downfall. Okay, two heads are always better than one. You got people thinking about things differently, and one person is talented and gifted here, and they're able to do something. Hey, I never thought about that. That's a good idea. What are some other positive uh, spins on having uh, good partnerships in your life? They can share the load. They can share the load. You're not carrying it all by yourself, right? I like working on cars and motorcycles, and generally I like doing it by myself because I don't want somebody messing with it. Unless they know more than I do, then I do want them to mess with it. But unless it's something like a transmission, I've pulled those out by myself before, and I've learned in life it's always better to have a partner when you're pulling one of those things out. What else is, what else is good about having a partner? You're not alone. You're not alone. What's wrong with being alone? It's lonely. It's, lonely. <laughs> it's discouraging at times. One of the things about churches with small, smaller churches is uh, in this country, their uh, pastors are known to struggle with discouragement and being lonely rather than a, a church with a multi-staff. Of course, with the multi-staff, they have the headaches of trying to work with other people. And uh, in a small church, you have the headache of working by yourself. What are some other pros of uh, positive things about having partners? You'll accomplish bigger tasks. He's on mic. Does everybody get a microphone now? Jeff. <laughs> you what did what did you say again? Bigger you bigger task. That's right. You you can do more with more people. That's a good thing. What's a what's a, what are some of the negative things about? Uh, are there negative things about having partnerships? You have to deal with the other person. And they have to deal with you too. All right. And uh, it's, it's hard sometimes. And so when you look for partnerships, you got to look, you, you hopefully you try to find somebody that is reasonable in their, uh, reasonably in agreement with what the goal is and personalities and things like this. Marriage is a partnership, right? Did you know that the average marriage couple, I might have shared this statistic with you a few weeks ago. I'm going to share it with you again because it really is eye-opening. Uh, on average, a married couple disagrees on 70% of the issues that they have in their relationship. 70%. You know, uh, that unbelievable. Now, those who stay with marriage, they learn to say, you know, these things aren't worth fighting about. And I'm going to concentrate on the 30, 20, 30, 40% we agree on. And, you know, I will submit and, you know, uh, put the other person before myself. And marriages can still be very healthy, even when you disagree. But that's an important thing about uh, relationships, right? Partnerships. Uh, it's so much better to have a partner that sees eye to eye on you, but good luck finding one totally, right? That's why a lot of companies, uh, you, you know, the CEO, it's his way or the highway, and they can be very successful, although sometimes it can be very frustrating for people at work underneath them because, you know, it's always your way, and I have an idea, and you're not open to it. A smart businessman or businesswoman will be open to those ideas that are different from theirs. Partnerships are key and essential. And one thing, we talked about you're not alone. It brings up the idea that uh, partnerships help us uh, from being too discouraged. Uh, from being overwhelmed with the, the things and helping us to see things uh, from a different perspective and, and actually can help us keep going forward instead of quitting. How many of us c would just find things, you feel like quitting until somebody comes alongside and says, you know, 
Let's just talk about it for a little while. Talking to them can often set your mind at ease, your heart at ease, and you realize, you know, it's not as bad as I thought it was. I, I'll share this with you. When I was pastoring out in Colorado Springs, and remember you used to get the Sunday paper, it would be about that thick. Every Sunday I'd come home and I'd pick it up. You know what section I'd go to after church? Sports. No. Wanted. Help wanted. <laughs> Help wanted. And I, I would just go through that all afternoon until I got out of my system and then I'd get back to work again. <laughs> you know? I haven't done that when I'm here only because we don't get the Sunday paper anymore. <laughs> We're going to be talking about partners in ministry uh, grab a Bible if you'd like. I'd encourage you because we're going to be talking about Father's Word on uh, Colossians chapter 4. And just for a quick page reference, if you're using this wonderful blue Bible, I'm on page 985. We're going to see the, the, the importance of, that Jesus puts on not being alone when you're doing work for him. And I, I'm I'm sure that you're going to understand that these principles that you find in here can just work in so many different areas of your life, whether it's at work, at the home, in your neighborhood. It's just this idea that God never meant us to be alone and try to work things out alone, although there's some things you do want to do alone, brushing your teeth or something like that or putting your socks on, you know, I can do this, I don't need your help. But generally, in, in, the, in the big heavy things in life, God says, you're not alone. I never meant for you to be alone. I am with you. And in fact, I have others who are with you also. If you would just open up your hearts to them, open up your eyes and see that they're available for you. We're going to see, first of all, that when it comes to partnerships, uh, they're there for encouragement. Now, Paul's writing this letter. If anybody needed encouragement, I can think of in the scriptures, uh, there's a number of them. But this, when you read the story of Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was one who needed encouragement and needed comfort. He was a strong man. And it, it, it's not a sign of weakness to need somebody to give you courage in life. Even the strongest men or women can be faint of heart and discouraged and, and want to give up when, when they're faced with the overwhelming pressure that sometimes life brings upon us. Paul was such a man like that. If you read his story, especially when he brings it out in, the, in his letter, second letter to, to the church in Corinth, he talks about all the struggles he'd been in, shipwreck, being uh, uh, scourged with whips a couple times, being kicked out of towns, being left for dead. Uh, we read later on in, in one of the last letters he writes in 2 Timothy, he says, I'm all alone except for, he, he names one other person. He was a man who needed encouragement. Uh, he was a man who would uh, look for people like Titus. He was very fond of Titus. Titus was a partner of his. And, and he was so discouraged because Titus wasn't there that he left the ministry, went looking for him in another city because he, he needed that man to be part of his life. And, and God is going to, I'll be very honest with you, you know, I need people in my life and you need people in your life. We are wired that way. We, are, we need it. Uh, and anybody says, you know, I, I do things fine alone, I'm saying, you, you think you can, uh, and you probably are surviving. That's all you're doing is surviving. You're not going to thrive unless you have that person that's in your life, whether it's a close friend, uh, a co-worker, uh, some kind of partnership, a marriage partner, uh, uh, a relative, a brother or sister, a mom or dad, uh, an adult child, is somebody who's part of your life that is there to, to just put your, their arms around you and you put your arms around them and say, we can do this together. Let's read this here, in, in verses 7 through 11 here. Uh, Paul writes, he says, Tychicus will tell you about my activities. He is a beloved brother a faithful and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your, may encourage your hearts. And with Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, Aristarchus, uh, these are tough names for me to say, people, so bear with me. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have re received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers 
for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. So he's, this is the end of his letter. He's written to the, this church in uh, Colossae. And, and he's writing to them about people, uh, people that he knows personally, people that have had an impact on his life, and people that have had an impact on the lives of the people who he's writing these letters to. And look at some of the words he talks about. He talks about Tychicus, uh, who, who is a beloved brother, faithful minister, a fellow servant. He talks about Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. And if you go back to some other books in the, in the New Testament, Onesimus was a former slave, I'm assuming now he's free, that ran away and runs into Paul, and Paul brings him to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, he is now set free in Christ, but Paul then sends him back to his owner, who is a believer, and, and asks the owner, you know, I could use him. Find it in your heart to forgive him and set him free for me. And apparently he does. So Onesimus has a, had a powerful impact in Paul's life, and Paul had a powerful impact in his life. He talks about uh, Aristarchus, uh, I'm sorry, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. Apparently uh, this person also had been imprisoned in jail. Paul is in jail right now. This man must have been in jail at some time. Uh, in prison for his faith also. So he, he knew what it was like for Paul, and he was able to, to bring that kind of comfort to him. He speaks about uh, John Mark. Uh, Mark was the uh, author of the Gospel of Mark. He was the cousin of Barnabas. Barnabas, if you remember, was one of the uh, uh, first uh, founders of the church. He was a man of God, and he, he gave sacrificially of his wealth and of his personhood, and he was Paul's first partner in a missionary journey, and he took John Mark with him. And of course, John Mark, if you remember the story out of the book of Acts, uh, got homesick and went home t uh, to uh, and left Paul on the mission field with Barnabas. And the next trip, Barnabas wanted to take Mark, and Paul said, no, he's not ready to go. But later on, at the end of his life, when Paul is in prison facing a certain death, he says, I could use John Mark. He is useful for me. And he's involved with, uh, with, with uh, Paul right now. So, and then there's uh, Jesus, who is called Justice, and that's all we know about this guy. But he's, his name is written in Father's Word, and it's going to be there for us to, to understand that these people were important to Paul. He knew them by name. Why Jesus was known as Justice? Because I think we'd all assume humility. <laughs> Who would like to be called Jesus when you're, you know, when you understand that, that the person of God in the flesh and uh, who, who did so much and gave his life for us and is holy and perfect, uh, I would, could imagine that, you know, guys, let's call me Justice from now on and not Jesus. I'm assuming that's what it is. But if we look at these passages here, the, it, it just really speaks about the nature of relationships and how important they are to us and how important they were to Paul. Paul was this super saint, we would think. Paul was this great theologian. Paul was a man after God, and yet Paul needed people in his life, and he was not afraid to say so. He wasn't ashamed to say, hey, I need people in my life. Look what he says about uh, uh, Tychicus. He says he's a beloved brother and faithful servant, fellow bond servant in the Lord. You know, and look what he's going to do. He's going to meet with you. He's going to come to this church in Colossae, and he's going to give you information, because I know your heart is wondering about me. And so this man is bringing comfort to Paul, and he's bringing comfort to the people and the church he's sent to. And, and God brings us people into our lives, and he brings you into people's lives for these very same things. Look at this here. He's sending, I'm sending him to you for the very purpose that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. And to comfort your hearts. It's a sad thing when we can go through life and say, yeah, I, I'm okay, I don't need anybody, and I don't need your comfort, and I don't need your encouragement. And the fact is, that's just not true. And now, now, there are many times, we can go days and weeks and months where we are uplifted and strong, and that's when we're to be available to other people to bring them comfort, to bring them encouragement, so that sometimes they can turn around and come back and bring us the comfort and the encouragement that we need. And then he talks about uh, justice, G and Jesus who's called justice, who are the circumcision. Now, what he's saying there, the last two names, uh, Aristarchus and um, 
uh, Justice and John Mark, they were of the circumcision, which means they were Jewish believers. Why is this significant? Not for religious reason, but because they understood Paul. Paul was Jewish. And what happened to Paul? He faced tremendous difficulties, tremendous challenges, and tremendous persecution at the hands of his own people. And for us, it's kind of hard to understand the depth of that that, that, uh, that, that Paul and these other Jews had. They, with, with Judaism, they gave their life to this. Paul was a Pharisee. He understood the laws of Moses. Remember, he was a persecutor of the church. He st so strongly identified with Judaism that he was putting to death and arresting Jews who were turning on Moses, as he thought. And then to have these, then he came to faith in Jesus Christ. He understood Jesus Christ as the Messiah, God who came to live as man, who lived a perfect life, who died and sacrificed himself on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, yet rose again on the third day. Paul understood that. He became a person of faith. He believed. He was born again. He became saved. And then he was rejected by the Jewish people. And it hurt deeply. And so for these three guys who are others of circumcision, they understood. They could come alongside of Paul. So we know what it's like. And Paul says, yes, you do know what it's like. And that was a great comfort to him. How many times do we find the greatest people of comfort in our life are people who have struggled with the same things that we've struggled with? I've talked to people, and I'm sure you have too, who can come from a very abusive upbringing, and they can try to explain it to me, and I can say I can see it, but I don't always feel it. I don't understand it in the same depth that you do. You went through it. But when I bring somebody alongside of them, or the Lord, I should say, bring somebody alongside of them who also grew up in a very physical or an emotionally abusive home, all of a sudden they have this identity with one another and they can understand one another. And that's why it's so important for us to not be afraid to share our life stories with people because you might very well be the person that can come alongside and bring comfort to somebody and to bring encouragement to that person. Because you grew up like that. Pastor kids, PKs, are often can get together with other PKs and understand the, you know, it's, it's hard for pastor's kids. You can ask my kids, you know, you don't, they didn't get a choice to come to church. They came to church. They never had a choice, I don't want to go to youth group. No, you're going to youth group. Well, I have a job. Get a job that doesn't make you work on youth group nights. Those are the rules they lived with. And, you know, and it's hard, you know, to be under that watchfulness of, of church members. You know, there's pastor's kids doing this. Get two pastor's kids together from different families, and all of a sudden they can nod at each other. I know what it was like. It wasn't all bad. Just kind of bad for them. Do you know two things happen when you come alongside of somebody? And the word comfort that Paul uses here he says, they were a comfort to me. It comes from a word that talks about coming alongside of. It's not a distant relationship. It is, I'm coming alongside of you. I'm going to be alongside. I'm going to be next to you in order that you might understand that I'm here for you. And two things happen. You encourage them. And this is the way God designed our minds to work, by the way. You encourage him. And here's the, what happens as a chemical thing happens. As God designed you to, to, that your brain would release chemicals when, when you do something that is well. And that person, that, those chemicals start to be released because you're there for them and they feel comforted. But something else happens because those same chemicals are going to be released in your mind. You know, all of a sudden, you are encouraged. You know, one of the best cures for loneliness is, what do you think it is? You know, doing something for somebody else. Get involved in somebody else's life. All of a sudden, you're not lonely, as you felt, right? Just, do you know one of the best cures for discouragement is? Serve somebody who is in great need. And God rewards you, and he, he made your body to work this way that it would then release this dopamine. Is that what it is? 
I mean, some of you doctors are not into scientists are letting me know I'm right. Your dopamine is released in your brain. You feel good. So two things are happening. You, you connect with them. They're encouraged. They're strengthened. They feel loved. And all of a sudden you feel, I'm doing something worthy. I feel loved by God. Not because I'm doing work, but I, all of a sudden God pours that sense of wellness into my life because I'm helping somebody and I'm not getting, doing it for any other reason that I care for that person. And if anybody in the New Testament needed, you have Jesus, but other than Jesus it were these apostles. They were given this tremendous task of taking this gospel message to people who are going to hurt them, arrest them, and even martyr them, kill them. And they needed people around it. And that's one of the reasons we come to church, by the way. It should be one of the reasons, because uh, we, we need each other. And when people say, I don't need church, I would say to them, well, but we need you. I don't need church. I can, you know, I'm, I'm okay, you know. But we're not okay when you're gone. I could use that smile from you. I could use that handshake. I can use, you know, your presence in my life. So come to church. Even though you don't need us, somehow you've reached that place in your life where you don't need us anymore. God bless you. Uh, if that's the way you think, but come anyway because we need you. That's why it's so important for us folks when we walk by somebody here. It's hard for us because I know we got like tunnel vision. I don't know what to say to that person, so I'll pretend they're not there. I know it's nervous for you, but look at that person and give them a half smile. Say good morning, smile. They'll leave this church and say, that's a friendly church. Well, they do nothing. They just smiled at me. One of them came up and talked to me. And I needed that. I needed to be noticed. I needed to be, feel like I'm a person that somebody cares about. And that's why God sent these people into these, the, he mentions five of them in this, for, these first past verses here. These five men were intricately involved in Paul's life and they were going to be involved in the people's lives elsewhere too. Let's go on here. And we're going to see the partners for faith and maturity. In other words, the partnerships have a goal and a purpose. They're not just there to make people feel good, which is important, but they're actually to help people turn and get in the direction that leads them to, to healthy relationships with one another, but more importantly, with God. Let's read verses 12 and 14 together. <clears throat> Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you, and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. So now he mentions three more people, Epaphras, and he mentions uh, Luke, the, and he calls him the physician. We know Luke to be the writer of the uh, book of Acts and the gospel of Luke, and this is the only passage that he talks about him being a doctor, uh, but he was also just known as a, uh, he was an intelligent person, a man of, of study uh, with the ability to, to attend to people's physical needs, but he was also a great historian and investigator, and that's why God used him to write these great books of Luke and the uh, gospel of, uh, of uh, not the, uh, the book of Acts, and he's able to bring out these details because of his intense, serious research into the matter. Then there's Demas. Nothing's known of Demas except for later on he walks away from the work, and in another letter Paul writes, so Demas has left me for the, uh, he loved this present world more than he did the kingdom of God. But right now he's on page with with. Uh, Mark or with the Paul and I'm sure Paul's writing these letters and and people knew something special and they just say hey tell him I said hi too and Demas was one of those guys say hi to say hi to him for me too but let's take a look at this here he, he says uh, Epaphras uh, if I ever have another son <laughs> I'm not going to name him that because I can't pronounce it Epaphras who is one of you he's one of the people from the church in Colossae He's one of them. And God often does that with people. He brings, I had this person 
that you feel safe with, that you know him. He's not a fraud. You can let down your guard with him. And that's so important for us to understand that how God works. He, he really does care about us, and he understands where we are. He understands our frailties and our nervousness and our anxieties at times, or, or our caution, or our you know, standoffish, because I don't know who this guy is. He's coming into our church, and God says, I'll take care of that. I'll send you somebody who you know because it's important that you listen to him. So there's Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you. Always striving, and the word striving could be struggle, always striving for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And so here's this focus of the ministry. It's not just, let's, let's have a, a, a club, a, a social club. Yeah, we do social things together. We have fun, and uh, next month we're going to have an ice cream social out here in the grounds with tacos and things like that, and it'll be fun, and the uh, whole family can come. We do things like that, and that's important because that's how we, we, we let down our guard and we start to understand and know each other. We can enjoy each other. But that's not the focus of what we exist for. We exist for this, that we can come to know our Savior and to be complete and mature. And actually the word... Uh, Perfect is mature, okay? It's maturity, that you might be mature, not missing anything in your life, that you would know all that Christ has to offer you and that we might grow in, in his likeness. I mean, let's face it, folks. There's, if, you, if, if you want to be like anybody in the world, why would you like to be, like, be anybody but like Jesus when you just read a his passion of life, his goodness, a sense of power that he has, and I don't mean abusive power, but he just was so self-confident in who he was. Of course, he was God. And we can't be God, and we won't be God, but he can make us like a human being was meant to be. In all his humanity, he says, I want you to be like that, complete, mature, fully grown up. And this is why Epaphras was going, and he struggled in prayer. That word struggle means he was fervent. He, he would not give up, and he would, he would pour himself out unto these people. And, and that, uh, we, we can understand why, because he knew these person, and he cared about them. And that's so true about us, is that we pray more fervently for those who we know. I mean, I, when I think about wanting somebody to come to faith in Jesus Christ, I mean, there's a whole world, and I was walking the other day and talking to God about a certain individual, and, and that person is important to me, and I said, God, I just want you to give this person the grace of understanding and give this person the grace of repentance that they would change and come to you. And God says, I, I, I didn't hear a voice. But I just sense God saying, but there, what about other people too? Do you, ca you care about this person because you know them. Now understand there are so many people that I know, and I want them to come to faith too. But it's okay to pray for those people that you know deeply and personally. And they should be in the forefront of your mind and your heart. And so Epaphras knew these people. And you think about the people that you personally know. And are we fervent? In our prayer, are we struggling with it? Now, if struggling is, it means you want to quit. You want to quit. The, 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 the tension is there. I want to give up. This is hard. I'm weary. I, I, I'm tired. I don't see an end to it. And Epaphras would not give up. He would not quit for these people. And wouldn't it be wonderful to know that somebody is praying for you with the same fervency and the same passion because that person deeply cares about you, as God does. And so God will bring people into your life, and if you don't have some, pray, God, give me somebody who would pray for me. And God would say, fine, but then I'm going to give you somebody to pray for them too. And that's what goes around. And ask God to give you somebody that you can pray for and struggle over. And it can be a, a relative, it can be a co-worker, it can be a neighbor, it can be anybody that... God puts upon your heart and say, God, give me that one person that I can pray for, that one couple that I would pray for, and I'm not going to stop praying for days, weeks, months, or even years. If you put it upon my heart, God, would you take that challenge and pray for that person? When you're going for a walk, when you're praying for other things, when whatever you're doing, anything, just pray fervently for that person. And that's what these people had Epaphras for. 
we go on here and, and as, we, as we think about this purpose and goal, um, you ever had break a bone? Yeah, you'll, you'll know this one. I was goofing off as a teenager at night when I was after curfew and running from somebody in authority. I wasn't doing anything immoral, just not home in bed when I should have been. And I jumped this old snow fence and it broke on me and fell down and my arm went like this here. And when the police came and they wouldn't let me go home and they called an ambulance, something, this is dumb, 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 dumb. But they, they, they set the arm, you know, because it was in pain and they, they just... <laughs> Why did they do that? To relieve the pain, right? In part. But they do it and they put it in a cast so that I could use the arm in a healthy way for the rest of my life. See, the goal of healing is so that we can function, right? So that we can do that which we are meant to do. Why does a doctor set your, you break your, your femur bone? Is that what it's called? Is it firmer? Femur. Thank you. Uh, you do, because it's painful, so they set it. Yes, that's why they said it, but it's not why they said it. They said it so you can walk on it and run on it and do work and perform and have a life. They, they heal, yes, to relieve the pain, but so that you can do the things that you were designed to do. So in the church, well, why do we bring Christ into people's lives? Well, we want them to be healed. We want them to find Joy. We want them to go to heaven. Absolutely, we don't want them to uh, understand. We want them to understand that without Christ, there is no forgiveness. So please come to Christ, know Him. But ultimately, we do it also so that they will become better human beings. They would be able to function. Yes, the pain is gone, but now take that healing and be a full human being and pursue that. You know who Margaret Mead, anthropologist? Uh, she lived. I don't know when she died, but she was a very famous uh, anthropologist uh, in the last century. And she was once asked by a reporter, uh, as she, uh, they asked her, what was the first sign of civilization that you ever encountered or saw or heard of or read about? What was the very first sign of civilization? You might think, well, maybe some stone remnants of a village or something like that. And she says, no. Anybody ever hear this before? This is fascinating. Oh, I'm not going to tell you then. It was a healed, firmer bone. Now think about that. That was the first sign. Why, why is that a sign of civilization? What's that? They had to have somebody take care of the poor chap because he's going to starve or thirst to death. You know, right? Somebody had to take care of that person. For the weeks it took or months it took for that bone to heal. That person was an invalid. You cannot walk, you cannot crawl with that kind of a broken bone. And that person was cared for by somebody else. It's fascinating, isn't it? First sign of civilization is human care for another human. And that's what God put upon our hearts. He wants us to care for one another. It goes on here, and, and let's read the rest of this and come to the closing of this book, and that is, ultimately, we're not just partners with other people, we're partners with Jesus Christ. Verses 15 through 18. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read to you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Archippus, see, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. I wonder if Paul, who is writing these letters, understood that they were scripture or God's word. I don't know what he knew. He knew enough to, to under. He, I do believe he knew that they were messages from God to people, but would he have compared it to the writing of Moses or the Psalms or the, the prophets of the Old Testament? I don't think he had that sense personally. That's just a guess. I think he understood they're important. But these were scripture, and he's writing to people, and look what he says here. 
Uh, when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and uh, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Now, we don't have this letter from Laodicea, so the Holy Spirit decided uh, in his wisdom that it wasn't necessary to be part of our scriptures. It's long gone and lost, and it's not relevant to where we are today. But the fact this is, and that is the reading, public reading of scriptures, is part of our partnership with Jesus Christ. We read scriptures here. We say, this is what God's word says. We're not here just to, to have me talk about them, even though I do talk about them, uh, but to read them so that you would see yourself open up your scriptures or look up on this board, because I will put it up here too, because it's very important for you to make eye contact with the word of God and see what it actually says and not just trust me. For years, for centuries, uh, scripture was unavailable to the common people. Common man often, did, you know, back in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, uh, not everybody knew how to read or write. And then, then the uh, Church of Rome decided that Latin was the language of God and they would uh, read Latin to people and people didn't understand Latin until the time of Reformation and what happened when uh, Tyndale and uh, uh, what are some of the other... William Tyndale, in, I think he was in the 1400s, um, Huss, other people. I was thinking of the missionary that write the translate scriptures. Whitcliffe. Uh, Whitcliffe was another. These men decided, this is stupid. The people need to hear the word of God. So they started translating from Old Latin. Actually, they went back to the Hebrew and Greek and started writing it in the common language of the man. And they started passing it out. And what happened? They got arrested. And people like Tyndale was executed for that in England uh, d during the reign of... Um, King Henry VIII, and, and Martin Luther translated the scriptures from, from uh, Greek and Hebrew into the German language. And of course, the, the Roman church didn't like that at all because they were losing their power. So it's very, very important for us to understand here that what Paul is saying here is, I want you not to hear it from me. I want you to see it yourself and read it. This is what he's saying here. He's saying, when this letter is read among you, I mean, they couldn't pass it around. They didn't have the printing press, but at least it was read out loud. You have Bibles. I have 25, 30 Bibles in my office. Uh, I'm so privileged for this here, and it'd be so foolish of me not to take advantage and read these things here. And then he closes with this idea here. He, he, there's this guy. What's his name here? Another hard name for me to pronounce here. Tell Archippus. This is Archippus. I know it doesn't look like him, but it is. It says, tell Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord. He's part of the church in Colossae. And he's saying, don't quit. It's a hard work. Finish the task. So I picked this picture up here, and I wish at the end of the rope there was Jesus pulling him up. I couldn't find that one there. But see, isn't it just so typical? You, you seem, you're struggling. You want to quit. And then you got this heavy backpack on you. It's all the cares of this world. They're pulling you down. It's the cares of people. It's the cares of ministry. All these cares. And you just want to let go and say, ah, I've had it. I, gotta, I, I quit. I don't want to do anymore. Some of us are there. Some of you work so hard. Families and ministries and jobs and things like that. And so, so easy, it'd be so easy to let go of the rope, right? Don't do it. Don't let go of the rope. If you have to, you can find a little cleft and sit down and rest if you need to rest. But don't, don't give up. Don't let go of the rope. Jesus is at the other end pulling you up. Finish the task. Work hard. Take your breaks. Don't work alone. Could you imagine what it would have been like if Paul, if he didn't have Tychicus or John Mark or Onesimus in his life, or if Nympha didn't ever open up her home for a local church to be in her home? What would have happened? Where would the church be without the church where Christ is working in our lives? You are so important. What are we doing this week? VBS. VBS. Hey, we're going to have some fun. It's a lot of hard work. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights. A lot of hard work. Some of you have already done tremendous work. And then we're going to have some times of giving to these kids and, and just 
make and help them understand Father's Word and things like that. And uh, well, what are we doing in the back table? Collecting what? School supplies. Somebody brought in two big boxes of, of backpacks this week. They're under the table. You should see all that, just piling up there. Why? Because we're, we're not rich people, but in our abundance, we want to give to those who don't have it as well as us. What are we going to do when, I, I put down August 14th, but it's now the 20th. Taco, ice cream, social. That's when we're going to get to have minister to ourselves. So we're ministering to kids, we're ministering to children outside the church. We're doing these things together. And if it was just Michelle who's doing nine, so much of the work, I don't know if it's 90%, but probably 89.9%, without her, where would it have been? Without Eric helping with the uh, uh, drive, if, if, if we weren't helping him, he would get one backpack. But now there's boxes of them because we're all stepping up and doing this. This is fun, people. You're not doing it alone. And these names are written down for posterity. Guess whose name is also being written down? Your name is being written down in the book of life if you believe in Jesus Christ and received him as your Savior. And also in other books, your, your ministry is being written down because Jesus just can't wait to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my glory. That's what he can't wait to say to us for the work that we're doing. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your commitment to us. And thank you for bringing each other into our lives. Thank you for all the people here. Thank you that we're not alone, that we have friends, we have partners in ministries, we have people who can encourage us and comfort us. Thank you that we can come along others and comfort them and encourage them. Father, this is the way you designed it. This is the way you want it to work. I pray for VBS, Vacation Bible School, this week. I pray we have lots of kids who come and can hear about Jesus and hear about the love that you have for them, Father. I pray for the uh, school backpack and school supplies that we can continue to, to bring things here to give to needy students. And I pray for ourselves, Father, that we can take time and be encouraged and uh, comforted ourselves and not just think that we're so strong that we don't need that. Thank you for making us who you made us. Thank you for Jesus, who we want to grow up into maturity. And thank you that we can read the word of God here open for all to hear. And these things I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.